Welcome to Tropic Topics. This is the first in the series that we're doing. Um, my name is Prudence Gill, and I have the honor of bringing all the people together to form this new initiative. So um, welcome here, and we will be doing this uh, each Wednesday night over the next five weeks. Uh, we have two upcoming speakers with us tonight, uh, Kathy Keith. the table are some flyers so you can pass them around and it'll give the titles of the talks and the dates and we have Franklin Kaplan over here who's going to be <laughs> so um, thank you and I want to say my thanks to Roxy Lewis and the Community Center staff for facilitating this event um, and to the active seniors of the Key Club um, for their sponsorship as well as the Community Center for its sponsorship before we begin, um, everybody kind of get comfortable. This is an informal gathering, so you're welcome to ask questions as Clint goes along. So uh, this is our host tonight, our guest host as we're referring to it, um, in our informality um, with Singing for the Soul, Clint Bush, who's a native New Yorker. Um, he practiced in Gainesville as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and now has uh, and now is, is a practicing occupational medicine in Miami. He's been on the key for about five years, um, and he is a proud member of the Rotary Club. Um, and there are other tidbits of information about him on the flyers. And then I'm just going to hand it to Clint. Thank you, Prince. Thank so. you very much. <laughs> So we have a very nice turnout tonight, and I want to thank you all for being here to begin with. Um, we're, we're really here to talk about community and engaging with community and celebrating community. And um, our community could be defined as either our little community here in Key Biscayne or the Miami community. It could be our American community. Uh, some of the volunteer work we're going to hear about in one of the subsequent talks talks about uh, an international community. Uh, I was struck by uh, what I saw on this flyer that you've all seen, and some of it's in front of you, that, that really what, uh, what Prudence put together here is a, um, a series of talks of how our various passions help us to connect to community. So sort of going down the list, Jane Torres will, quote, communicate across cultural, religious, political, age, and gender differences to create the kind of community where we feel respected. Franklin's going to talk about political philosophy, democracy, and civic engagement. There it is. There's that word. Uh, uh, Kathy's going to talk to us about volunteering around the world. Well, how could you be more uh, connected to your community than by giving your time and energy? Uh, and uh, uh, the last one is, yeah, Patricia Woodson, what constitutes a healthy community? Her passion, there it is, for keeping nature front and center in our lives drives her civic engagement. And so what I'm meant to talk to you about tonight is how I got connected to this community where I've only been for five years uh, through musical activities. And um, I think the best way to get started, let's do this. I want to play some music right at the start because what, what I want to focus on here is in fact music. Uh, this is uh, some of the best music ever written, in my opinion. This is Johannes Brahms. Uh, it's his uh, German Requiem. It's the uh, fourth movement. It's the, um, the text is in German. And uh, I, the, the music should speak for itself. So uh, I just want you to hear. So this is choral music at its best, and that happens to be, uh, you know, where my passion is at the moment. Go.
so the text is uh, how lovely is thy dwelling place. It's a it's a, a biblical text, uh, and that was seraphic fire. You'll hear me talk more about seraphic fire. They are the uh, the most amazing choral group you will ever hear. Uh, and so, part of I'm going to plug seraphic fire and even give you some information about how to. How many people here have heard them? Ah! Yeah. <laughs> they were here. Live. Here. They were here. They were here. They were here. Oh, right. You might not know that I, that I was the one who helped facilitate no. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, Patricia Woodson and I put that together. So, um, so anyway, uh, I love the Brahms Requiem. I got to sing it when I was in college, and it's still uh, way up there as, uh, as one of the real favorites of mine. And a, a little bit about my background. So I, as you heard earlier, I practiced orthopedic surgery five hours north of here in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, when I got into my late 50s, I decided that it was time to do something else. And uh, my wife, Adair, who many of you know, she was the first veterinarian here on the key. Uh, it's actually her idea. We closed our practices we went, uh, decided to go sailing. We hoped to complete a circumnavigation in three or four years. Uh, we took seven years because we spent lots of time in other places. And um, overall, we, we visited 61 different countries and we were in something more than 350 different ports and harbors around the world. And, and how that relates to what I want to talk to you about tonight is you can't really develop a sense of community if you're in a different harbor practically every night uh, and you're in a different country every six weeks. So uh, so when, when we were only halfway through the, uh, through the voyaging and decided that that was, we realized we wanted community, it's going to be hard to get. We actually spent an extra four months in Singapore in an effort to dig into that community. We, we found some friends there in a church that we liked, and uh, that was one of the few times that we felt we could just take a deep breath and be connected. But it was certainly part of our desire, once we, once we got home, to be more connected. Uh, I've, I've used this metaphor before. It's the key ring metaphor. When we were out sailing, I didn't have a key ring. Everybody here has a key ring with them, right? So we were extraordinarily pleased and proud that we didn't carry keys with us because it meant we weren't attached to a house and we weren't attached to a car and we weren't attached to an office and all those things. Uh, the flip side of that is you're also not connected to your community. And uh, so it turned out to be a, a double-edged sword for us. Um, so when we got back here on the key, and that was five years ago, uh, we realized that uh, the way to dig in was to join organizations, uh, get involved in the church. Um, we started working on some nonprofit uh, uh, organization boards um, and going back to work. We both went back to work. Uh, much to my surprise, and it's sort of in retrospect, it turned out that those things, uh, even though I'm a very proud Rotarian, um, those things turned out to be not as important for my connecting to the community as music. And I'm talking about my participation in music as well as my enjoying the music that other people are making. Um, so uh, we already knew about Seraphic Fire. They actually came and sang at St. Christopher's in 2001. It was a free concert, right? Can you believe that, right? We were there. Uh, and we were immediate fans. So, so we started going to, to listen to them. And we thought, wow, this is pretty amazing. What a great uh, musical community we have. Uh, and we started going to the New World Symphony wall cast. How many people here have been to the, the wall cast? Okay, well, I'll give you more information about that. You should go. Uh, next thing you know, uh, six months into it, um, I had this opportunity to sing with the uh, church choir at St. Christopher's. Um, and I hadn't sung in a group for 40 years, something like that. And they said, well, we think you could probably do this. And we talked a little bit. And uh, I've been doing that for four years now. And uh, that turned out to be life-changing for me because the music director and the singers there are of such extraordinary quality that it gave me, it, it helped me in, in two particular ways. One was, uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but more than half the singers in that choir are members of the chorus of the Florida Grand Opera. 
So these are pros. They're not just pros. They are amazing pros. Uh, and our music director, John Barrow, is uh, just an incredible guy. And it, he knows the musical literature in such a way that it's just inspiring. So through the, through the opera singers, uh, I got connected with the opera, and I've now become an opera fan, which I was absolutely not before. Uh, and, uh, and I encourage you to, to pick up on that as well. The other thing is that uh, the guy who was sitting next to me one day nudged me and said, you know, you ought to think about singing with the, uh, with the Master Chorale of South Florida. So how many people know about the Master Chorale of South Florida? See, the, the numbers are getting fewer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'll tell you more about the Master Chorale, but I've been singing with them now for a little while, and, uh, and uh, part of what I'm going to focus on is some of the music that we did this year. Uh, we've got a couple of more selections. But, I mean, among the things that we've done, I mean, this is a, this is a typical score of what we're, this is the Bach B minor mass, I mean, it's uh, pretty heavy, right? The Messiah, we just finished Romeo and Juliet, and I'm going to play uh, some of that for you as well. It turns out, when we started rehearsing this, uh, it just seemed like not worth anything. By the time we finished with it and we were, we were singing with the orchestra, <laughs> mind-blowing, mind-blowing. So uh, I started singing uh, when I was in high school. Uh, I sang for four years in a, about a 30-person group that was an a cappella choir, so no, no accompaniment. I went on and did another four years of singing with the Princeton Glee Club, uh, and we toured Europe and Mexico and a few other places, and, and that was wow. wonderful, but sort of ended there, and then this long, long hiatus. Uh, I had studied classical piano for a few years uh, as a youngster. Uh, I still play piano, but it's not classical piano anymore. It, uh, it's other things, but I sing at the keyboard occasionally. Uh, but I never thought I'd go back to group singing. Turns out I was wrong. Uh, so I've been let down this path that's, uh, to me, really interesting. So did I you, I, yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, did yeah. You, did you keep singing on your own during those 40 years of not singing? Singing pretty sing? much for myself at the keyboard, yeah, yeah not performing. Uh, had a keyboard on the boat. Uh, barely brought it out. I mean, in seven years, it probably came out six times. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when we had guests aboard and it seemed like the right thing to do, we would, uh, we would do that. But it uh, seemed not to be the right thing. So I would, uh, I would submit to you, uh, these are a couple of ideas I came up with this afternoon. Music is magical. Music connects us to our deeper selves. Music is the universal language. And therefore, music is a medium which can connect us to each other. So, mm -hmm. can we do uh, this one? Let's see. I know she would say. So, uh, I should uh, tell you what. This is uh, from the B minor mass. So just listen to this and the harmonies in it.
you, but uh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous music. It's it's some of the most powerful music I know of, and I can guarantee you, if you get to participate in, you're standing in the midst of. Mm -hmm. Master Corral of South Florida is 120 voices, uh, full orchestra. It's just almost unbelievable, right? It's, it's an unbelievable experience. Uh, and, and that particular movement, it's, fr it's from the B minor mass, and it's written in the first half of the 1700s, and yet the harmonies in that are more complex than a lot of the music that was written in the 20th century. So Bach, Bach was already far ahead of his time. So I'll repeat those four assertions that, uh, that I made just a minute ago. Music is magical, obviously. I mean, to me, it's absolute magic. It connects us to our deeper selves. Uh, I truly believe that. It is the universal language, and it is a medium which can connect us to each other. Uh, I strongly believe that. We can probably also add it's uh, emotionally moving. It's, uh, it can be uh, so moving it's devastating. Uh, it can also be triumphant, and the, the next, the next uh, cut that I'll play for you in a minute uh, certainly goes, goes there. But uh, most of us have experienced in some way the magic of singing together. So uh, sing together at a party, sing together in a bar, uh, church. sing together in church as the congregation, right? Even if you don't sing in the choir. I can tell you that singing in the choir is also really, really special. Um, in the car. You know, sing in the car, exactly, <laughs> right? But I'm talking about singing, singing together, right? So singing as a group has a certain special magic to it that's, uh, that I, I can assure you is there. It's totally different from singing all by yourself, which I've done a lot of. Um, can you put on the, the, uh, the, next, the next CD? Uh, but then uh, it's also true that uh, singing classical choral music with a full orchestra, I mean, this is really serious magic. So uh, this next is uh, it's another, we just performed this uh, three weeks ago with the Master Chorale. It's uh, Hector Berlioz, Romeo and Juliet. This is the finale, and it's, uh, it's very big. It's very uh, triumphant and very uh, emotionally moving. And uh, let's see if we can do it.
played it so loud. When you're standing in the midst of the chorus and the orchestra is right next to you, it's like that. And it's, it's mind blowing. So uh, anyway, you can tell I'm having a good time with this. <laughs> um, you have a beautiful baritone. Uh, that's a, if only that were me, Frank. <laughs> we can pretend. Yeah. Can I, can I ask yeah, a question go. of everybody? How many people here sing publicly? Hmm. <laughs> How many sing publicly? Just, yeah. And the rest were all private singers. There we go. Oh, nice. But, you know, go sing in your church congregation. Join your church choir if you think you have any kind of talent at all. Uh, pick up that guitar that's sitting in the closet. Touch the keyboard that hasn't been touched in, uh, in years, maybe. Or become an audience enthusiast, because I'm, I'm also there. Uh, so I wrote down a few a few notes here just to keep my memory fresh. The Cleveland Orchestra at the Arst uh, Center. This may be the world's best orchestra. And they come to Miami and they do six different programs every year. They are amazing. If, you're, if you have any inclination to listen to symphonic music, the, uh, the Cleveland is just world class. They are extraordinary. They're right here on our doorstep. Uh, you shouldn't miss them. Uh, I can't say enough about Seraphic Fire. Uh, anybody go to the last program of uh, Russian music, right? Mm -hmm. So, did you hear what the conductor said, right? So they... What did he say? She. 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 What she say? I'll have trouble with this. I get emotional. <laughs> <laughs> no, she said that they were the best group she ever... She's been around the world. She can, she's a specialist in Russian. She's Russian. Ah. And she specializes in conducting Russian choral music. And she said she's conducted concerts all around the world. And the group of singers at Seraphic Fire is the best group she's ever conducted. Wow. Listen, listen to that. Thank you. I couldn't have gotten through No, I mean, it was beautiful. <laughs> it's, it, it tells and, you and so much. And also singing in a Slavic language where the sounds are different. Exactly, exactly. So they are, so if you're not going to see Seraphic Fire, like every single time, you're, you're missing out on a, on a fabulous, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely world class. And where, uh, where was that program going? The, we went to was it yeah. Saint so, Philip? So, so they was typically it, sing the Saint Philip's. Or they sing at the Greek church. The Greek so they, church. So they sing one program in. So they'll they'll, they'll sing a weekend program over four days, and they'll do uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Miami Beach sometimes, and sometimes sometimes uh, and they also go to Naples. Anyway, so you have to get your tickets pretty far in advance with them. Actually, you can yeah. still get. Not really. I don't know why it doesn't Christmas sell out every time. But the fun. Christmas ah, is the only okay. one that sells out. There you go. The you so, uh, and the Christmas concerts are amazing. They are amazing. With the candlelight and they, they are. They said they said a beautiful movie. Absolutely amazing. So I'm glad there's so many Seraphic Fire fans here because they're they're right at the top of my list. Uh, the New World Symphony uh, sounds like not everybody here even knows about them. Uh, the New World Symphony, I get emotional about this too. <laughs> so if you're, if you're at Juilliard or you're at the New England Conservatory of Music and you, uh, you could just go out and get a job with a symphony orchestra or if you want to get to the next level, uh, you go to something like the New World Symphony. It's unique in the world that it collects the top students from the conservatories who want, they don't want to go to work for the uh, Omaha Symphony, they want to be the second chair at the New York Philharmonic, and the way you do that is you up your game. You get extra training. So in medicine, this is like doing a fellowship. So you become extra specialized, you get more training, you get more uh, credential. Uh, so the result of that is you've got the cream of the crop right here in Miami Beach. They are amazing. What's even better is, and if you're not familiar with this, the wall cast. So they built the, the New World Center for them to, uh, for doing the concerts inside, but they put a 7,000 square foot white wall on the outside that faces a park with, again, what's, what's referred to sometimes as the most amazing outdoor sound system in the world. Uh, you bring your bottle of wine, your cheese, uh, your lawn chair, uh, you sit out under the stars on Miami Beach and you listen to this music, ladies and gentlemen, it's free. And it's fabulous. And uh, you shouldn't miss that. So, uh, so again, the wall cast, 
of the New World Symphony is, is just, I mean, again, it was invented here in Miami. I don't know if anybody else is doing it. If, you know, why, why the rest of the world isn't doing it, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's just amazing. You see the inside performers yeah. on the oh, wall? Yeah. On the wall. Yeah. And it's, uh, you, you can fool yourself that you're right in there. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been inside a number of times. I like being outside. Because they focus right on the soloist right. close up. And oh. It's, it's yeah. truly amazing. I mean, it's just an extraordinary experience. And they still sell out the inside even they though do. they've got the outside. They do, right? And there are, there are a thousand people outside, so you got to go early. I'll, I'll, I'll warn you about that. Uh, the Master Chorale of South Florida. It's been around for 20 years. Uh, it's 120 voices. Uh, we do three or four programs a year. Uh, the upcoming one is Gilbert and Sullivan. If you know Gilbert and Sullivan, we're doing selections from uh, mostly from Pirates of Penzance and the Mikado, uh, a little bit from the Gondoliers, uh, and so on. But we did uh, already this year the Bach B minor Mass, uh, the Messiah, the Romeo and Juliet. We did a Christmas program. We did a we did uh, sang uh, La Boheme up in. Uh, Boca not too long ago, a group of us went up there and did that. And um, anyway, uh, keep that on your radar screen. Master Corral of South Florida is really an impressive group, and uh, and the orchestras that we sing with are also first rate. Where are those performances? Uh, those are also we will usually perform one in just like Seraphic Fire, one in Miami, one in uh, Fort Lauderdale, third one in Boca. So the. Uh, the uh, Romeo and Juliet, we did all three performances in, at Boca at the Lynn University. Here's a surprise. Lynn University has a, a music conservatory that's got an amazing program. They put 70 players on the stage who were just incredible. Uh, Florida Grand Opera, can't forget about them. Uh, they're doing a, a really wonderful job, and uh, I go see them. I've become a big fan. It started because I had all these friends who were up there on the stage performing. Uh, now I, I go just uh, because I love opera, uh, which I used not to. Let's not forget jazz. So there are several jazz clubs around town. I like to go to Le Chat Noir, which is downtown. They've got great local jazz. Uh, you can have your dinner there while you're, uh, while you're enjoying the music and so on. So. Um, just last weekend, I went back to Gainesville. I lived there for over 30 years, and um, I have lots of old friends there. And they say, uh, are you coming back to Gainesville? And I say, no, I'm not. Well, uh, why not? I said, well, I'm really dug into Miami. I'm really involved in my community. And they say, what do you mean? I always go to this topic, the music. That's what I love here. That's what's got me engaged in my community here. And that's what's feeding my soul. So thank you very much for being here today. Other questions or comments? Do you know about Young Arts? I do know about Young Arts, yeah, yeah. But and they're uh, they're more yeah, they they also have drama, they also have dance, they have all that other stuff. Yeah. Performances for a week in January. These are high school kids that compete from all over the country in all forms of the arts and then they it's it's the, the, they're based in Miami, they're, they're at the Old Ricardo Building. Yeah. yeah. So what they do is they come here for a week in January and they do performances at the New World. Yeah, yeah. The past several years they've done, and they're terrific. They're the other thing that just finished is the Frost Music Festival at the University of Miami School where they did it. I don't know about that. Oh, oh my gosh, two weeks. Uh, yeah, it's did a anybody, month. Is it's it a month? month? Yeah, yeah they, of all genre all of, music, of music. And Charlie yeah. Bird was the dean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they were free. Yeah, many are free and some are minimal charge. So yeah, there's more yeah. There's a there's a real there's feast a of and, 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 yes, Baroque yes. music. Exactly. Yeah. So so Cliff, I want to ask you a question. So I know you know talking to people who perform in orchestras. Yes. The music is on the paper, yes. but a lot of it's the interpretation of the conductor and there are nuances yes. to the music and yes. some latitude as far as how it's actually performed. Yes. Does that same thing exist in choral music, and how much latitude is there to the interpretation of the actual notes on the page? Uh, I would argue that the human voice is the most versatile instrument on the stage, by far. Here's the singer. She says yes. <laughs> the, <clears throat> it isn't just volume. It isn't just crescendo and decrescendo. It's, there's so many ways of making different vocal tone. 
uh, there's staccato and legato, so it's either you know punctuated or it's all very smooth. Or um, yes, I th I think it's even much more intense, um, and so it's really easy to perform choral music and have it be seriously dull and uninteresting uh, or just bad. Or torture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You say torture? Yes, and, and, and among other things. I mean, the torture part, <laughs> if, if, there's a bad, if there's a bad performance, it's often, you know, that the tone isn't right, yeah, right? No. That you're singing, usually it's flat. Um, and so, uh, so a great choral performance is, to me, inspiring. So two of the groups that you heard here, one was Seraphic Fire, the other two were uh, the Multiverity, which is uh, John Elliott Gardner. This is another world-class uh, choral group, and uh, quite amazing. So uh, here in Miami? No, they're uh, they're European based. I think, <laughs> I think they're they're based in the uh, UK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, Robert Shaw, him, some of you may know that name, right? He was he was the big gun in choral music in the '60s and '70s, and he was uh, based in Atlanta. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I think that the interpretation of it, at the, it's, it can be so widely variable. I mean, you can do three or four different things with a flute or a French horn. Uh, you can probably do six or seven different things with uh, with a violin. But I mean, the human voice is just so diverse and so flexible. I think uh, it's higher than any musical instrument. Uh, piccolo is the highest, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but there's uh, yes. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, what did you say? I can't beat a piccolo. <laughs> so, yeah, great, great question. I was a coloratura way back, not anymore. But I still color piccolo is higher than that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Introducing children to music is the most important. And, you know, you hear it in your home if your parents <coughs> love music. You know, I grew up in Porky and Bass and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But we had, at St. Christopher's, we brought in a, um, I think it was the chamber group. There, I mean, about four of them came, the young... It was New World. Was it the New World? When and was it? This was when my daughter was Ninety-six there. to about... Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the children were just enthralled. Yes. You know, first of all, you know, they let them hold the instruments and they talked about it and then they played. And you know, it was something that a couple of us mothers organized, but it's so important for those things to continue. It, it is. Mm -hmm. And if you have 20 kids and, and only one of them gets seriously inspired, you've done a great thing. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I forgot, I meant to add to the list here, right? A Miami Children's Chorus with mm -hmm. Tim Sharp. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. What an awesome organization. Uh, there are, I mean, I know a half a dozen people here on the key. I've only been here five years, but I know a half a dozen people whose kids sang with Tim Sharp in that group, and it changed their lives, right? It's like the thing they talk about that was the Singing Sons. You know about the Singing Sons? It's another, another youth group. And Seraphic Fire is doing their own educational program. It was pulling kids uh, out of the schools and, and doing it, and now they're doing it in the schools, right? So it's uh, it's really quite I remarkable. To, to a dress rehearsal, I'm not a, a rehearsal of the, yeah. the full orchestra at once, and they, they, they let a peep at them, they were just in yes. trouble. Yes. Yeah, kid, getting kids involved is, I mean, I got started singing when I was in ninth grade, um, and I wish I had started before that. Yeah. Lee Chelson used to have a choral camp at the University of Miami and had a very big choral group. Right. It was really, yeah, he, he was amazing. And my daughter was in that choral camp for two summers and she still talks about it. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Actually, they take the high school kids and to the rehearsals of the opera. Ah, and we were, yes. we were at one of the rehearsals. Yeah. They were yeah. so well behaved. Yeah. There was one scene where this woman was jilting this guy who was really a cat. And the, all the kids went, yes! <laughs> 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 in the middle of the opera! <laughs> yeah. 
Gotta love it. <laughs> and also, at that same performance, they were dressed as if they were going to Oh, the yeah, they were all dressed It was up. amazing. Yeah. It really you know, was. Nice. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Anything else? Somebody else had his hand up. There you go. I had a recording one time that was called something like The Healing Art of, of Music. Ah. And, of course, humor is also healing, too. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, in that recording, they talked about the Gregorian chant. Mm -hmm. And the, they had a poem, a pope one time, who forbade them to sing. And they all became ill. <laughs> and then he disappeared, and they went back to singing, and they were all... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I'll plug Seraphic Fire again. They're, they're, they have two Gregorian chant albums, both of which are just superior. I mean, it's the best chant music you'll ever hear. And yeah. Clint, aren't a lot of the singers from all over the country? Picture? They are. In fact, there are only like one or two. So, so Seraphic Fire usually puts either 12 or 16, sometimes 20. I think they had 20 singers at the Christmas program uh, on the stage. So it's three, four, or five. Uh, singers for each part, uh, uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Uh, and of that group of anywhere between 12 and 20, uh, I think there's only one person who's even in set from South Florida, and it's not Miami, right? James Bass is from Tampa. The rest of them are from California and Chicago and Connecticut and uh, all over the place. So that's why, ladies and gentlemen, why? I mean, they've taken the cream of the crop, and, they, and where did they bring them? Miami, oh, man. right? Wow. It's my look. <laughs> uh, the best thing that happened to my son was he was in chorus in junior high, and the chorus teacher wanted to put together a barbershop quartet, and he got selected. And he continued with the, the same group all the way through high school, <clears throat> and he's 33 now, and he's still the best of friends with this group. With this Is life he still changing. singing? I wish he was singing a little more. <laughs> <laughs> When you talk to him, tell him that you talked to a guy who's 69 years old who has started singing again and that it's not too late, right? I mean, it's, it's great. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've not had a, a lot of uh, exposure to music personally, uh, performing, or, but uh, you know, I grew up in, in New York City in the 60s, and uh, I was lucky enough to go to a public high school that uh, we had a special English program that I was in, and we used to go out get off from school and, okay. and go and see matinees, you know, at the, at the, at, you know, at the symphony. And, and then my mother had a, uh, a friend who had uh, season tickets to the Met. And this was the Met on 42nd Street. The old Met on 42nd Street. And uh, used to get dressed up in my suit and the fourth balcony, you know, and it's like a sauna up there. And I realized <laughs> people came with shopping bags with an electric fan and they took their clothes off and put them in the bag with put the fan on themselves. So I learned, but I got to see a few grand operas that uh, it's incredible, that exposed it? it to me. I got exposed to it. I can't say I pursued it in any great degree. Yeah, I didn't either. So I, I was also brought to the old Met as a high school student. I was in school out on Long Island. We went in for a matinee. It was La Boheme. I remember it distinctly. Uh, and yet somehow it didn't take. I didn't become an opera fan mm -hmm. until a couple of years ago. But, uh, but Hansel and Gretel, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. It's been uh, wonderful sharing with you. And uh, I hope we all learned something. I certainly did. Thank you. Thank you.